San Jose, California, last October, the end users uh, came together for a summit. And out of that one, they predicted a potential of 39x growth in the next 10 years. 39x growth. Get your mind around that. So in London last November, our members made it clear that this growth has to be sustainable and that our community has to take the leadership position to find sustainable solutions to support it. So I want to thank Martin Lynch, uh, one of our advisory council members, and also Patrick Oland, who you're going to see later today, um, who's the chair of our sustainability committee, for their passion and persistence to get us organized, because without them, I don't think we would be doing what we're doing right now. So in February, we gathered a small team of industry leaders in San Jose to define the problem we were trying to solve from a sustainability standpoint, because we believe that was the right approach. First, what are you trying to fix? Then you can create an actual vision and strategy around that. It was an incredible session, and we had some very passionate people there that I think a lot of people know. It generated 14 pages of notes, and uh, we synthesized that into the strategy document that's been shared with everybody. And we held another session to finalize the content for this summit. And what I was most encouraged by is that this group united to not only define that vision, but committed to work together to drive it. Unifying, right? Uniting the builders of the digital age across common causes like this. So the vision is every click improves the future. We do envision a future where digital infrastructure continuously contributes to the economy and society without harming the planet. So we're uh, kicking off into our panel, and we're going to be driving into this uh, into this actual thing with some some great people here. Um, I think you're going to love as much as I do. All right. So let me go in a little bit about the bios of each of these people. So first with Tom Moran. Uh, yeah, after starting his career in the media industry, Tom transitioned to working in technology about 20 years ago, as a digital transformation was just starting to happen in the music business. Since that time, Tom has spent most of his career working on as a solution architect a strategy consultant and team leader, first with Savvis and then with CenturyLink. Two years ago, following the CenturyLink acquisition into level three, Tom moved to Amsterdam, great place, to establish CenturyLink's cloud, uh, hosting an IT services business uh, across the continental Europe. And one year ago, his responsibilities expanded to include leading sustainability for CenturyLink across EMEA, a role that is growing rapidly in terms of scope and importance to the business, absolutely. So next is Debbie Hobbs. Uh, Debbie Hobbs joined ISG in April of 2019 as a group director of sustainable business. She manages a team of 30 dedicated sustainability and so social value experts and is passionate about delivering net zero carbon buildings in operation, which use sustainable materials for a circular economy and add value to the local community. So Debbie is a, uh, a building uh, physicist and chartered engineer. So that's an MCIBSE term. And with 32 years of experience in the sustainability and carbon management sector, uh, she was a director of sustainability at AECOM and Environ, a head of sustainable for two, sustainability for two large property companies and a sustainability manager for a local authority, giving her unique insights into, into the drivers and challenges when it comes to sustainability. So next is uh, Lovisa Helgeberg. She joins us from Stockholm, Sweden, another beautiful place. Uh, she has been in the digital infrastructure industry for uh, more than seven years. She's been focusing on electrical distribution design and data center technical solutions. Lovisa was responsible for the full data center portfolio of a large technology company for two years before joining CBRE Data Center Services, where she is now working with business development and passionately driving sustainability strategies and initiatives. And finally is uh, Dr. Eotunde uh, Coker. So we call him Tunde. <laughs> uh, he has over 30 years of international experience across Europe, U USA, Asia, and Africa. He was born in Nigeria, went to school in Lagos, uh, we graduated with a postgraduate university in the UK. His distinguished career of 28 years in the UK include roles at Ford of Europe, senior management consultant Cap Gemini UK, uh, CEO, CEO of MNC Saatchi UK, director Egg Bank in the UK, the first European internet bank. Global Applications Director, BP, uh, Chief Technology Officer at the UK Criminal Justice and Group Director at UK Ministry of Justice. So quite a few uh, different roles there. He returned to Nigeria in 2009 as Group CIO to, uh, of Access Bank and then Managing Director and CEO of Emerging Markets and Payments in West Africa. As Managing Director and CEO, he built Rack Center uh, to build uh, to be a household name and leading data center brand in Africa, and I believe the largest one uh, across uh, all of Africa. 
And with global recognition and numerous international awards, he is the Secretary General of the African Data Center Association, and this year received the Distinguished Manufacturing Alumnus Award from Cranfield University. So first off, welcome. We've got quite a panel here, and I, I love the fact that you're, you're representing so many different distinct areas across EMEA. So thank you for joining me. Um, now, I, I wanna start with a simple question from each of you, and, and that is really about your personal commitment. What, why does sustainability matter to you? So, uh, Debbie, why don't we start with you? Hi, Dean, and thanks very much for the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, I was thinking about this since you, you first said, told us you were going to ask us. I think for me, it started sadly 36 years ago. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> a bit like Daniela, I went to do physics um, as a degree, uh, mainly because my father was an engineer. Uh -huh. He said, don't become an engineer, um, <laughs> do pure science and then go into engineering later. So I went off and did physics and by about my third year, like everybody, I was thinking, so what do I want to do now? You know, I like physics, I like maths, but what next? And I knew what I didn't want to do. So I didn't want to go and work in the nuclear industry and I didn't want to teach. And what I really was fascinated by, even then, 36 years ago, was how we could do things more efficiently. Why uh -huh. were we wasting so much energy in the world? And why weren't we using the natural energy? Um, and I think that's gone through my whole career, really. Um, I, as you said earlier, I've worked both um, client side, I've worked as a consultant twice, running sustainability teams. Uh, most recently for legal in general, the um, property company and insurance company in the UK, looking at both their 30 billion pounds of the property portfolio, but also how they run their funds in terms of ethical ESG investments. And it just makes me realize the only way we're going to crack this is to all work together, whether you're an investor, whether you're a consultant, whether you're a contractor, whether mm -hmm. you're a company you know we have to work together so for me i think the real interest is is how as people can we work together to get this done really excellent and, and again purpose driven careers i think are so amazing so and i love it here we got another example of influenced by your father yeah. right and going into physics and then yeah. now in our industry so it's just just so much brain power uh, that can be applied to this. So thank you for being in, uh, being in the industry to begin with. Um, so let me go to Tom. So Tom, your, uh, your reason, why is sustainability important to you? So it's funny, I, I wasn't planning on saying this until Debbie said her bit, but um, so my very first job out of high school was working for Greenpeace. Uh, okay. And I was a canvasser knocking on doors and raising money for Greenpeace. And, and my dad was a salesman. And although at the time I didn't know it, I was basically selling sustainability, you know, from the age of 18 years old, because you're just trying to raise money, right? Um, and, you know, fast forward many years later, uh, I, I've spent a lot of time working in customer facing roles and in sales and all that kind of stuff. But that, that experience was very influential in terms of, you know, being surrounded by all these people who were an activist organization who were very much focused on, on what was happening at the time, which was save the whales for those of us who are, you know, mm -hmm. old enough to remember that, that campaign. Um, and so fast forward now, you know, I, I've worked in both media and technology for a number of years. As you mentioned, I moved to Amsterdam a couple of years ago and my move here was, was actually not sort of, uh, it was not driven by, my job, it was driven by a bike trip that I made here uh, about five years ago with my partner. So we did a, a bike tour of the Netherlands and Belgium and France and fell in love with the place and the lifestyle. And and I moved here and relocated permanently basically. And I, I feel a real affinity to European culture, to Dutch culture, to Belgian culture, to French culture, all these other things that I've kind of adopted as my, you know, my new homeland, even though I obviously, based on my accent, I'm an American. Um, and I think that, you know, my involvement here now is with organizations like Amsterdam Smart Cities and, a, and a, a, an institute that I started with my partner called Aspire Institute, where we bring mm -hmm. students from the U.S. here to, to study uh, urban planning, civil engineering, transport, all the other things. There's some amazing things that the Netherlands does very, very well in terms of infrastructure around transport, around cycling, yeah. around data centers, around all this yep. other stuff. So for me, it was kind of a a values thing that got me interested in sustainability. And I've, I've sort of figured out how to weave that into my job. 
you know, and, and sort of sell that within a larger organization where I had enough history and enough credibility to be able to raise my hand when this opportunity came up and say, hey, I think I want to do that sustainability thing in a bigger and more important way in my day job because I've been doing it all along, you know, as, as my sort of hobby, if you will. Right. Yeah. And so for me, I think that was a, it was a major shift. And, and now hearing, especially Daniela talking about all the things she's working on with smart cities and all the other things like just, it was just really inspirational to me. And I, I'm super excited to be involved and, and have been frankly, since I Mason started uh, with the whole thing. So for me, there's a lot of personal passion and motivation wrapped up in all of it. That's awesome. And thank you, by the way, for your contributions. You've, you've been here from the beginning, Tom. So really appreciate that. Uh, and, and what I also love is that you, uh, you get to get paid for a job that you like to do. <laughs> yes. Well, indeed, you know, you know, my motivation was, was cycling. I get to cycle to work every day. Yeah. Right? So I have this and I, now I'm doing in COVID lockdown, I do my virtual commute which is I get on my bike and I ride for 30 minutes or 45 minutes in the morning and then I come back home and I work. And then at the end of the day, I get back on my bike, I ride another 30 or 40 and I come back. And that's kind of how I'm keeping myself, you know, sane in the, in the that's lockdown great. world. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Excellent. So, so we've heard from uh, the UK, we've heard from uh, the Netherlands. So I'm going to jump over to Lavisa in, in the Nordics here in Sweden, right? So, uh, yes. so tell me why sustainability matters to you. Well, you know, I think that sustainability matters in, in, in all aspects of life. Um, and, you know, for myself, I started thinking about this. Um, now, during this pandemic, I've been spending a lot of time sitting at my kitchen table. And, and I built this kitchen table myself um, okay. out of some, some old logs that I found um, uh, outside our, our summer house. And they've been lying outside for more than 15 years. And now sitting here... Uh, you know, I feel incredibly proud, uh, and I feel that this is something I can probably pass along uh, to the next generation. And, you know, this is, I think, something that also, you know, comes to mind in business and, and sustainability and, you know, being proud about leaving something behind. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, I, I'm lucky in, in my work that, I, you know, I'm able to see how, how best practices are deployed um, in the different data centers that we manage across the world. And, and I see that sustainability matters also to our clients. And, and not just that, it matters to our clients' clients. Um, you know, there are studies now showing that, um, you know, people are willing to pay more for cloud services if they are proved to be sustainable. And, and I think that's just, that's it. You know, sustainability matters to everybody. Everybody wants to feel proud. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's, there, especially the generational differences, the, you know, do you have a purpose and, and it's more than just work itself. And so the environment and those pieces are, are deeply embedded in those decisions. And that's why I think this, this uh, vision is so poignant and so will resonate so well across the generations is it, it really is about improving the future. And all of us are mm -hmm. part of that future, right? And it's about yeah. our kids' kids. It, that's what matters in this. How are we going to make sure this planet is here and they get to, you know, enjoy the things like Tom riding to work every day around, uh, around Amsterdam, right? Even if you're doing it in your, in your office, <laughs> but yeah. that's really, uh, it's, it's just inspirational. I think there's so many things that we can do here. So let's, let's fly on over to West Africa. So um, Tunde, tell me why sustainability is important to you. I think one of the things that Lucas has said is um, what you leave behind. Uh, which uh, resonates resonated with me. Um, to put it in, in context, um, very much um, when I got back uh, to West Africa, uh, my role has been more sort of Pan-African. It's really quite charming seeing the mm. um, development right across Africa. Um, you know, um, some of it is industrial development. A uh, lot of it also is a very natural environment, amazingly natural. And I see quite a lot of green in the background of, uh, of my picture there, as well as a lagoon and Lagos. That's a canoe there with people fishing, you know, and it's just the, some of the um, environmental richness that you can get. So that brings a challenge as well, actually, because if you look at um, percentage of world population, Africa is 17%, um, but of GDP, Africa is only about three to 4%, coming up to 4% of GDP. Yeah. It's what I call the prosperity gap. You know, it's really is a prosperity opportunity. How do you close that gap? You know, uh, mobile telephony has shown so much that you can achieve 
um, but still 4G is 4% 4 um, of a global 4G uh, footprint. And we know that if you have broadband penetration, just 10% broadband penetration adds um, on average 1%, but in really growing economies, about 2% uh, mm -hmm. to GDP. So that then gives you the conundrum that how do you get digital infrastructure to enable the growth that's required? And COVID has also shown a variety of things that supply chains will shift um, to uh, de-risk global supply chains. That's a massive opportunity uh, for Africa. And digital technologies have now shown, especially the global elasticity that we have, you talked about it earlier on, in supporting the global fabric, enabling you know, work from home and so on. And we're all talking about the fantastic impact on the environment. Right, so that the challenge, therefore, is how do we uh, grow digital technology? We know data centers underpin digital technology. If it's if it's got to do with the broadband interconnectivity or whatever, it underpins it. But they're very dense users of power. Right. Um, I only I got into the data center business coming into Africa because the bank said they wanted to build a data center. I said why? Well, they said well. What do you mean we'll collocate? People steal our servers and so on. Go back here and couldn't find one collocation place, so we <laughs> built one. And so that then started my involvement in the in digital infrastructure because you have to build so much here for your use. And I really started to then worry quite a bit about how can we actually achieve all of this in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And I initially felt, well, really not quite possible with the density that we need to, to, to build the challenge on the one hand for growth, which gives a certain level of sustainability, and the challenge on the other hand for green, which needs to support the growth. Mm -hmm. And what's in the last few years I've found in look, really looking at this seriously is that, that actually you don't have to separate both. It's not an insurmountable challenge. We've got plenty of sunshine here on the equator, right? It's um, on for 12 hours in a day. And you start to find that the technologies that build doesn't mean you run the data center um, totally on solar or green or renewables. But even by being able to supplement some of the energy demands, you know, that the, the demand is so high in itself gives a significant amount of sustainability benefit. So you, you then try to get that win-win. And as you know, win-win are always very difficult challenges. But then, of course, when you're faced with the crisis of thought, how you achieve these things is when you really get the innovation going. So it's sort of a quest. How do we get the innovation going here to achieve the win-win on yeah. growth for the economies we have here and delivering digital infrastructure? Absolutely. And, and this, this uh, um, we'll, talk, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but there's such different perspectives, perspectives on the, the stage of the journey that each of you are on. I'm talking about from your regional perspective, you know, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk through that one, but the, it's, it's right on uh, Tunde. So let, let's, let's shift into another question here. I want to talk about the iMason's, um, you know, industry sustainability vision. Every click improves the future. So what does that mean to you? And Livisa, let's start with you. Um, yeah, well, I, I really like the vision. Um, uh, I really like that. It's such a positive statement and, uh, you know, I like how it includes both um, economy and society and, and also what digital infrastructure actually enables. Mm -hmm. um, and I was talking to a friend the other day, and I, and I think people listening in to this could probably recognize themselves in this. Um, you know, she read somewhere that, you know, data centers are these energy consuming, I think she used the word monsters. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, she's working in a small tech company. And and I asked her, this was after the pandemic started now. So I asked her, do you think that you would be able uh, to sit and work from home and, and stay connected? It, you know, do you think your company would survive uh, if you weren't able to do these things now? Uh, and, and she immediately said no. Um, so I think that just shows how essential uh, our industry is. And, you know, we're really part of an ecosystem here. And, um, and you know, um, you know, we, we talked about circular economy and I'm not I'm such a strong advocate for that. And, I, and um, Daniela was mentioning earlier about um, heat recovery in Stockholm. And if you look at, at Sweden overall, um, we have about 50% of all households are connected to the district heating system. Wow. Um, 
And, uh, but of course that doesn't cover all of it. So there are a lot of interesting projects going on, um, looking at drying timber with the use of waste heat, looking at you know, farming insects, connecting to, to warm greenhouses. And, and, and I personally think that, um, you know, drying timber is probably one of the most interesting ones because mm. timber is, is one of our main export products um, in the Nordics and Sweden. And, and, you know, when we're part of, you know, circular economy and part of giving back, I think that's, you know, how we can positively impact um, and trying to reach this vision. And, and I think that's just how we need to think about, um, you know, how we're part of this. And, and you know, I, I recognize that these, these are examples that are very specific to, to my region, but, you know, I also see that there are a lot of similarities uh, between different regions. And, and, you know, even if we take something very specific, uh, we can apply those sort of best practices, um, mm -hmm. you know, across the globe uh, with just minor tweaks. I think that's, that's just a big part of it. Yeah, and you, you bring up a really important point. Um, you know, the, we talked with John Tassillo about the governmental view and then the public view. And right now, uh, digital infrastructure is not being demonized. It's not being positioned as, you know, uh, this, this planet killing type thing. Because I think, as, as we said, there's a lot of people that, like what Daniela mentioned, there's a lot of people that don't have the insights into what it is and the work that's been done. I mean, the amazing work as an industry that these leaders have done to try and go back and address sustainability, you know, without being regulated. They're not being forced into this. This is stuff that we're all passionate about and doing the right thing on, right? And trying to go back and change things like this, this vision itself. So I think this is, again, never waste a crisis. This is the opportunity to help educate across government, right? The public and the private sector uh, to really pe have people understand their dependency on it and why it's important for the future. And then why it's important that everything that we do is going to be circular economy, renewable energy, everything when it comes to that carbon aspect, but the supply chain, the life cycle, every, every aspect has to be considered when we think about what the future really looks like. So, um, so let, me, let me jump over to Tom. Um, give me your perspective on the, uh, the vision itself. Sure. So, you know, like Lavisa, I, I, I'm really inspired by it. it. It makes a lot of sense. It resonates with me. And I, in thinking about this question after we had our initial conversation, I think there's two big things there for me. One is that it it evokes a sense of shared purpose that, that goes outside our day job and our company or whatever. We all work for companies that have mission statements. We all have families. We all have other things that we're committed to and that we care about, right? And so for something like iMasons where the, the objective and the goal is to have a positive impact, right, to give back, there, there has to be these kind of statements that we can all gravitate towards and we can all resonate and we can find a shared sense of purpose around them. And I think it does that really, really well. Uh, the second thing that I think is super important is that it's aspirational, right? Um, because to me, that, that shared sense of purpose comes from the fact that those of us who work in the industry, we know that the industry has a net positive impact. Uh, you know, Daniela talked really eloquently about kind of the research that's been done and, and we've done the same sorts of things. We, we can easily, if we're good at it, talk about what we're doing right, what we're doing well, and, and, and all those other kind of things. But at the same time, the companies that are, that are leaders in the sustainability world, that are, that are the most respected and the most valued, I just, I just read a great book by uh, Yvonne Chouinard, who was the head of Patagonia. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're a very respected company. And Patagonia doesn't spend a ton of time talking about what they've already done that's great. They spend a lot of time talking about what still needs to be done. And they align themselves with not just our goal as a company is to do X. Uh, they look at what does the planet need? When do we need to be carbon neutral? And we work backwards from goals that whether it's the Paris Climate Agreement, whether it's something like that, you know, yeah. we as as a group and as individual organizations, as as members of our own companies and our communities, have to be aspirational. And because we work in an industry that's technology driven, we also have to be science based, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you when you combine those two things and you start to think about what does it really mean to have aspirational goals that you can share, not just within your own company, but among your peers and everyone in your industry, 
that are based on real science, that are not based on just, oh, my company wants to do well, I want to make a profit. I mean, we, we had a great conversation the other day about how um, sustainability is something that, that delivers competitive advantage, right? Mm-hmm. But, but John also made a really good point that sustainability also has a, a shared element to it. And I think iMasons brings that together, right? We can all go back to our own companies and deliver operational benefits and operational excellence and, and value. But when we're leaving our business card at the door, as you yep. guys put it, right, then it's about the ideas. It's about the aspirations. It's about all these other things where we, we, we share a set of goals. And, and that, that statement of improving the future just articulates that really, really well and, and much more concisely than I just did. So, <laughs> No, you, you actually added a, a lot to that. That was very good. Uh, so, Debbie, give me your, uh, your take on the vision. Yeah, I read it and then I reread it and I thought, wow, this is actually quite challenging. And I really liked it. I think for me, um, the real challenge is how do you show this, this net positive worth that data centers, the IT industry can bring to the world, basically. Um, and although I understand number two about having renewable energy available to everybody, that for me is almost a given in that we will eventually have a world where we've generated as much renewable energy as we possibly can and mm-hmm. the thing is that there's a, there's a finite limit on that you know we we can only generate so much renewable energy so the challenge then is how do we share that around um, and what do we do and to give you the idea of the balance that this brings that, that i think is quite clever is that Well, a lot of um, corporate clients are setting net zero carbon targets based on science-based initiative. One of the solutions and one of the main issues having run a portfolio of buildings is not in building it and designing it, but it's how you operate it effectively and efficiently. Yeah. What we have in the UK is very de-skilled facilities management team because nobody's wanted to pay for facilities. So the solution is having a thermal model that predicted the low carbon um, design linked to meters and lots of data in the field, Mm -hmm. extension reporting when the building's not performing and giving intelligent information to a caretaker or operator. So saying, you know, you've left your lights in zone four, go and change the time clock. Um, So the IT and data center will provide a solution yet they also need to use some resources to do it. Um, So how do we show the net positive gain here? Um, And in the UK, we do um, a lot on social value and we use something called uh, national TOMS, themes, outcomes, and measures. And we can calculate the net benefit of saving carbon, saving water, working with community, innovation is even costed on an economic modeling kind of basis. So for me, the real challenge is, is really probably number three. How do we define the framework and how do we weight that to mm-hmm. give it a sort of score? And, and number five, how do we radically innovate in our designs of data centers? Um, how do we look at the materials we use? We're seeing a lot of clients asking about embodied carbon modeling. And yep. how do we make sure data centers, um, I think as Tunde said, generate as much renewables as we can? You know, why isn't the roof of every data center covered in high density PV? Um, and, and I understand why, but I think we've got to unlock some of that potential. You know, there's a lot of opportunities um, to show this kind of net worth in the, in the field. Yeah. Right. Yeah, totally. And, and look, there's a couple things going on right now that you think about radical efficiency, you know, renewable energy is only gonna become baseload when we have beyond grid scale energy storage for greater than 30 days at gigawatt scale. That is the only way this is gonna work because you know, as we said, the sun shines X amount of hours a day, but if you can capture all that, that'll power the world, just the sunshine. So that's the radical efficiency we really gotta think about. And, and uh, I think that, um, that that's the stuff that's gonna come out. If you look at Microsoft, they've got the billion dollars uh, innovation fund billion dollars that they're now going saying bring us these future ideas this is their contribution this is what they want to do because for them to get to pay back all their carbon right ever emitted since 1975 by 2050 
They have yeah. to figure out a way of doing carbon capture and all types of different ways to truly make every click carbon negative and improve the future. Like that's, yeah. there's just, there's no way to do it without something like that. So, so Tunde, I want to, I want to go over to you on the, on the vision itself. So give us your perspective. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I agree with Debbie with respect to the net, the net effect, you know, and really this, the, the innovation aspect of things. I mean, whoever thought that a battery powered sports car will out accelerate a twin turbocharged supercharged V8 uh, off the line. <laughs> and, um, you know, it would be normal to drive around um, and get reasonable range. And that continues to improve exponentially. The, um, I remember 30 years ago reading an article about diesel engines and how the, they, they would be um, you know, pervasive and everywhere in 20, you know, about 15 years time. It felt like a long time ago and um, suddenly we've got diesel engines doing 60 miles to the gallon. Well, that's, things have changed quite a bit. Yeah. But you see, the, it's, it's really it's the motivation of innovation in terms of what we can achieve. And as long as we continue that quest to say, how can we achieve that and achieve a lot more with respect to the power requirements we have, there's something else that may actually turn out as well. It's, we don't have to keep growing and growing and having more and more heat producing compute uh, platforms where new technology like graphene may come in and transform right. the ability to, else we'd be covering the earth with data centers with the growth of data usage. So I don't think it'll harm the industry. I think it'll just give it a new rebalancing uh, of, of the industry. But coming back to the um, net effect uh, that Debbie was talking about, I live in Lagos. It's a city of about 22 million people. It's a mega city, about the fifth largest economy in Africa. A bit like Los Angeles, the fifth largest economy in the world, you know. Mm -hmm. And people travel three hours sometimes each way to work. Uh, what's happened now is the, the working from home, or it actually could be working from near home. So when people go to the next location, it's a 20 minute drive from home. And you're not trying, you know, going three hours each way to the head office. And that's been enabled by digital infrastructure. One of the things that's happening here as well is smart cities. Uh, the state government here is in, in investing a significant amount of smart cities it's really taking on the challenge of how do you reduce traffic? And it's one of these areas where you'll find, you know, places and cities in Africa will actually leapfrog the world because you need innovation to make things a lot more efficient, to make the environment much more uh, conducive uh, to people. And those investments are going in. That's what it means to me. Therefore, that every click improving the future, right, is actually the net effect of the impact we have in the working environment on people's lives. But also, actually, if you have economic growth, like I outlined before, um, well, every click that enables that economic growth enables the future of the very young uh, population we have here. I always bring in the Africa perspective. It's where I am right now. It gives an interesting perspective that, you know, the median age in Africa is, uh, depending on where you are, it's anything from about 18 to about 20, 22. That's a very young uh, population. Yes. That's the future. These are, these are the age, this is the age group where people just stake to digital technology. They live it, they uh, adopt it, and they look at, incredibly creative ways of using technology to create a better now and to create a better future. And that's how I see that click, you know, you know, and really, uh, really capturing uh, the, 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 the um, message that every click improves the future. Yeah, and Tunde, uh, you hit on a topic that's really important, and I want to double click into this, so I'm going to stay on with you for this, but I want to go into four specific areas with each of you uh, about um, things within your regions that are so critical. So first off, let's talk about scale. Okay, so you just talked that 18 to 22 years old, so you're 1.3 billion people, correct? Yes. So you're the same size population-wise as India. Yes, and so uh, yes. And India, by the way, a little older, but they're still average age of 26. LATAM, same kind of thing. So just take these three areas. There's going to be more capacity generated and built within those three areas. LATAM, 
Africa overall and India, I, I believe that's in the world right now. And just help us understand what's the total capacity for data centers in Africa, the continent right now? Um, the total capacity is around about 150 megawatts, uh, around about that level. 150, um, maybe, okay, hold, hold yes. on a second. 150 megawatts. Let's just get everybody perspective mm -hmm. here. Uh, Microsoft turned up 100 megawatts globally in two weeks, mm -hmm. almost as much as the entire continent of Africa when it comes to digital infrastructure. And so in China, they're building 300 megawatt campuses all the time. So that if you just look at scale, the ramp that's gonna come across those things is gonna be huge because as you said, that whole idea of the younger generation, as soon as they get connected, you talk about right broadband, as soon as they start getting more and more access, it's gonna just drive demand uh, through the roof. Is that? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. I'll just give you some perspectives here. So we have maybe 150, 160, well, around about that much. Um, if you compare that to just um, Amsterdam, Amsterdam is around about, um, it's just Amsterdam is one, 1 million people. And Amsterdam is around about 320 megawatts, I think, of installed <laughs> base. So it's half, 1.3 billion is half of uh, Amsterdam. And about 40% of that uh, 100 and so many uh, megawatts I talk about is actually located in South Africa itself. So there's the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa that has to, that will grow given the dynamics I've talked about. That's also 25% of what's available in London, a city of about 9 um, million. And another perspective is this, Africa, especially where you look at the, uh, the sort of west, western uh, part of, west central part of Africa, has yeah. a fantastic geophysical location. So it's actually, um, you know, midway between uh, the Americas and um, Asia. You know, it's only a four hour flight to uh, Sao Paulo, you know, four and a half hour flight. So that's mm -hmm. in its reach, you know, from here you get around Africa and four, four and a half hours um, and to Europe. So there's a great geophysical location and you're going to start to find that this redistribution of supply chains yeah. will mean that digitally enabled um, new ways of working, global outsourcing, business process outsourcing, better efficiencies are bound to move to this kind of location. The people generally tend to speak very good, clear English or French. Africa is about, um, there are more people in Africa that speak English, but there are more countries in Africa that speak French. Okay, <laughs> so you have an interesting split there with respect to how you can um, man manage the world. And, you know, people who work here, if you speak to Microsoft, they've got a development center here. Um, you've got uh, tech experts who have a growing um, a footprint yep. here that provide global support. They talk about the incredible agility and smartness of the people that they have here. So if you combine that to the um, uh, uh, generally younger uh, uh, median age, what you're talking about should actually come through this. You see, we should see, we really should see these things come together and create a, an exponential growth. Yeah, I think it's inevitable. There's, there's, there's just no, <laughs> the next couple billion people coming online are going to be in those three areas. Yes. Right? They're, they're yes. saying 500 to 600 million are going to come out of, of, of just yes. India alone, right? Yes. So Africa, yeah. India. So, and and I, the interconnection you'll find between those areas, you see, the eastern seaboard of Africa is connected to Asia, um, Kenya, Johannesburg, the east of mm -hmm. Africa, Ethiopia, and into the Levant. Middle East. So there's a connectivity over there and yeah. you can see what Google and Facebook have been doing with their new cables. The Western seaboard is actually connected to South America, rounds through the West, off to the US through, you can go hop through Fort Letza straight into um, uh, Florida at less than, you know, 80 milliseconds or so and into Europe. So there's an interrelationship of technology rebalancing and uh, ecosystem that'll start to happen between Asia on the East and South America and Africa uh, together. And yeah. you know, when you talk about the edge, you start to see the redistribution of compute uh, workload right through to those edge points. Yeah, and there's a potential leapfrog that's gonna happen in these areas of going to edge first, like China did with mobile payments mm -hmm. and phones. Just 
they skip yes. the bank aspects. So I, I, I want to go to a complete contrast to this. So Tom, I'm going to go to your side. Um, here we go with you know massive uh, projected growth coming out of this from a huge population across the continent that's actually placed uh, for the world to, to de-risk when it comes back right. to supply chain, to Amsterdam, which is one of the, the most important internet connections in the world, right? But less yeah. than a million well, people, and you guys have stopped building data centers. Yeah, well, Purpose. temporarily anyway. Yeah, but yeah. And, and that's a good point. You know that the here the justification to build a data center depends partially now on how the local community feels about your value, mm -hmm. and so things like heat exchange, things like your you know how you're gonna what, how many jobs are you gonna create? What are you doing for the community? It's yeah. um. You know, for me, coming from America and part of the reason I move here, you know, this is a very civically minded part of the world, right? Especially compared to, you know, now you hear a lot of countries in, in crisis talking about us first. In the EU, they're talking about, you know, funds for the North to, to support the South's recovery and those kind of things. So there's a lot of things about this part of the world um, that I think are really compelling in terms of our ability to you know, support and export things. And, and one of the things that occurred to me um, when Tunde was talking, you know, one, Europe as a whole has a very aging population and an entirely different set of problems around right. funding social welfare and, and jobs and things like that. And in Amsterdam, for example, for every position that's available, or, for, or sorry, for every candidate who's qualified to be a, take a developer position, there's about 25 to 30 openings right now. So there's about a shortage of about 55,000 headcount in the Netherlands just around IT jobs, right? And this is a tiny little country. At the same time, you have a country that has roughly one third or, or is third in terms of agricultural exports globally after mm -hmm. the U.S. and China. But the mm -hmm. land area here is one third the size of the state of Minnesota where I'm from. So when you think about that. And, and then you look at things like water management, for example, which as climate change starts to impact coastal regions around the world is going to become a fundamental infrastructure issue for all these different cities. The Netherlands is the best in the world at water management. And so that technology, greenhouse technology, my, my nephew created a, um, a, a business in Minnesota to grow lettuce and other things in greenhouses in the middle of winter in Minnesota. All the technology came from the Netherlands. So the guy who installed it all, you know, came from Amsterdam. Um, so. <laughs> So I think that there's a role that these big Western economies with histories that go back to the days of the Dutch East India Trading Company and, and all the other things that go with that, right, have a, a really important role to play in a new world that is, by definition, much more interconnected uh, and much more dependent upon each other. And if we, you know, if we look for things like supply chain efficiency and these other things that we know are going to come out of COVID, but we do it in a way that's nationalistic or that's protectionist or, or whatever, we're going to create more problems than we solve. And so I think what this part of the world and, and the, the progressive EU legislation like the Green New Deal and all these other things bring to the party is that that mindset that's going to be super important in terms of uh, supporting all of the evolutionary changes that need to happen, not just in, you know, at our industry, right. But at that kind of macro socioeconomic level. And, and yeah. so I feel really good about being in this part of the world, not just because I'm in a big data hub and I work for a ICT company, right. But because it's, it's an important role that Western Europe is going to play in, in where we go from here. Yeah. And you know, that reminds me of two things. So, uh, you know, Lavisa was talking about too, is, is kind of the social acceptance aspect of this one as these things start to grow and and then also scale. So, Lavisa, you you've um, you've talked about uh, the Nordics themselves and how um, uh, how massive the growth has been, but also how sustainable it has been already. Can you just explain a little bit more about that from the scale um, standpoint? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, I think compared to mainland Europe. Um, the Nordics is still considered a bit of an emerging market. Mm -hmm. um, we've had data centers around for a long time, but it was only in the last maybe five years or so that we've seen a massive growth. And it's, uh, it's predominantly coming from hyperscale self-build um, right. investments going into the region. And, you know, um, the prediction now is that we're seeing additional uh, capacity coming in of about 
300 to 500 megawatts per year until 2025. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's major. And, you know, um, I think that, you know, the main reasons why um, these companies have chosen to establish themselves uh, in this region is, is, of course, we have we have a lot of space. We have a lot of land for this, these <laughs> these big establishments. But of course, one of the biggest reasons is we have um, you know such an access to uh, renewable energy. Um, and hydropower is is you know a, a base part of our energy mix. Um, last year in Sweden, we had about 12% uh, wind power, uh, mm. and it's growing um, all the time. And um, and it's being mixed up by uh, by nuclear, um, which is not a renewable, but it's still considered a carbon neutral uh, energy source. And I mean, yeah. that's I think a massive reason why why they they chosen this region. And and I, and I think that just speaks to the fact that you know site selection is incredibly important uh, when it comes to sustainability. And mm -hmm. and you know, looking at the whole uh, cradle to grave. Um, um, you know, thinking. Uh, it starts with maybe site selection, goes through design, how we operate, and how, how we dispose of a data center in the end. And, um, you know, but, but I also see, you know, challenges in, in our region. Uh, I previously worked with demand response uh, solutions and in the electricity grid and how to integrate, you know, volatile energy sources uh, into the grid. And, yeah. and you know, you know, we have the challenge of, of being reliable and at the same time really flexible and fast. And um, and going into the data center industry, I, I see the same challenges uh, that we're struggling with. And um, and I think we found actually some good uh, solutions to, to to these problems. And when we work together, we can probably get much better results. And um, yeah, you know, actually. You know, um, I, I wanted to bring up um, a case study that that we did not too long ago. Um, this was um, it was actually not in the Nordics. Um, it was for for digital realty in the U.S. And um, and, and what we did um, is that um, we used big data and predictive analytics um, to validate a, a data center site's uh, energy effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And and you know, not not only did this um, you know, sort of help with, with um, energy improvement measures like looking at airflow management and um, clack unit replacements. But there was also an interest from the utility uh, to help um, use this as a reporting tool to streamline their uh, utility uh, incentive program. Uh. And I think that is hugely important uh, that we sort of find these, these ways to utilize uh, what we do within the digital infrastructure, um, and um, you know, this is actually core part of, of our business is is hand collecting data, uh, and we apply it in, in a setting like this, and, and you know, it can really help us um, with innovation and radical innovation that's going to support not just implementing renewable energy into into the grid, but also how mm -hmm. we find you know a business case where where it's also incentivized uh, both by the utility and, and by the data center itself. Uh, it has to be a, you know, a sustainable, profitable business case um, to have um, you know, this combination of um, uh, you know, renewable uh, energy um, mm -hmm. you know, a, as part of the, the solution. And I, you know, this this brings up a a really important point for our last question, and that is, you know, the uh, ability to work with utilities, um, the ability to take innovations that have already been here and apply them, right? And really thinking and and bringing other industries in on how we approach these challenges and working as almost like an ecosystem, as we were talking about with Daniela. And so um, I, I want to go to uh, to Debbie on this last question. Help us help us understand um, how we could work together on this vision. Give us your perspective on what that that will take as a community. Good question. Um, I think, you know, what we can do is look at other sectors as well. And how has the office sector worked together to, mm. get to net zero carbon uh, buildings and how are other sectors working together to improve energy efficiency, for instance? Um, mm -hmm. 
And I know in the data center world, my colleagues are telling me you have the PUE metric, but I think that doesn't really give a, a true efficiency in terms of how much energy the data center is using given its output. Um, so maybe we need to work together to define what we think the best efficiency measure would be. Mm. Um, and it's always good to, to throw in a few like, um, you know, sort of competitions, healthy competitions here. So can we produce league tables of the efficiency? I think there are some around, but you know, how, how can we um, develop a framework that allows us to score different data centers on their sustainability? I know there's a lead um, assessment for data centers, but it's not widely used. So can we make one that you know, works for people? And can we make that a standard, which like Daniela and Louisa are saying, is not just the data center itself, but how it integrates into its whole area, both in terms of um, uh, cities, smart cities, you know, both in terms of um, the actual community and social value, and how do we sort of make that system? Because I think the, the answer is, you know, we've got to get data centers to be a key part of the infrastructure of cities. Yeah. But everybody trying heat networks to date has always failed. Um, the finances, you know, from the legal and general perspective, they can't make it stack up because they haven't got enough of a heat load. People build heat networks, but then they can't get people to add on to them because of time mm -hmm. lag as well. You know, it takes a long time to build a housing estate next to a data center or whatever. So I think we've all got to work together to start looking at how sustainable data centers are. And then work with the data center owners um, and specifiers so that they understand what this is all about um, and show them the benefits of it as well. So yeah. they're not frightened by it. <laughs> right, and again, that goes back to how do you get the community and the you know, the, the private sector and public sector working together on this because it is really helping everyone. So, so Tunde, let's, let's go to you. What, what do you think we should do about the um, working together on the sustainability vision? Um, I think this is a great step, uh, for instance. And there's another approach that really shows that sustainability is also competitiveness. It gives you competitive advantage and if we're able to show the two sides of the, you know, the, the, the benefits we get um, broadly in sustainability uh, to the other side of, well, um, it, it does give you competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. I think we have a you know, good platform uh, to, to start to, to, to rally around. Um, and um, the, the more we do that, the more we start to think about that, then the more we, we get the industry moving in that direction. There's an interesting metric I use uh, for where I am here. We've got the 1990 challenge. Yeah. We've got 90% 90% humidity and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. It's like you know, but not better use it Fahrenheit because you know the 90 90 degrees. Uh, so it puts something like um, PU into perspective, because you know, a I understand it may not be a perfect measure, but it gives you some sort of reference point to say, if I save this amount, because of the scarcity of energy and cost of the energy you're using, um, then it has a huge, it has a huge impact. So that brings two sides to the coin, competitiveness and uh, the whole issue about the broader uh, a goal uh, and quest uh, for sustainability. Yeah, and I, I, I think there's, there's another metric here that's called uh, that we, we created called uh, the data center performance index. So Debbie, uh, and this really goes into both the, the economic side, the, the availability side, and as well as the environmental side, but getting some type of grading around that one to say, are you achieving that? And then we go to our, you know, our uh, standard data center framework. Like, is there a way to go back and classify what a sustainable data center is? And I agree that there's just got to be more than PUE. PUE is an important metric, but it's only one metric. It doesn't take account anything on the left side of the decimal, the one of the load. It's the right side, the point something. So, um, all right. Well, uh, Louisa, give us your perspective on how we can work together on the sustainability vision. Well, you know, I have to agree. I think... Um you know, taking part in, in different forums, we see how regional policy and local legislation really affect 
uh, sustainability decisions. And, um, and I think within the iMasons, we have a fantastic opportunity right now to actually unify the industry uh, on these topics when it comes to metrics, when it comes to uh, you know, how, how we, we measure sustainability. And, and I mean, uh, we have different forums that, that try to work on, um, um, you know, policy questions. We have the EU Code of Conduct, we have, you know, e EU DCA, um, you know, driving sustainability topics on the EU level. Uh, we have local uh, organizations. Uh, in Sweden, we have, um, you know, the Swedish Data Center Association driving sustainability topics. Uh, on a local level. Um, we also have NodePol, for example, who, who actually launched their own uh, label, uh, fossil free data labeling. Um, and I think, you know, all of this is fantastic. We ha have all these different ways of, of measuring. And, and, uh, but I think what we need is to sort of set the standard. Um, so I think we need to have this overall, um, you know, goal. And, and I think this vision helps us with that. And I think creating the sustainability framework is going to help us with that. And I think it's going to help us, you know, it, it needs to encompass all of these regional and local uh, aspects of it. And, and I think with the members we have within this community, I mean, it's, um, it's uh, local players, it's hyperscalers, it's uh, uh, supply chain, it, it's, it's everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I think we really have a chance here. Uh, you know, we, we have a momentum right, right, right now, uh, to be able to, to really drive this change. Uh, and, um, yep. yeah, I, 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 I just think that's, uh, that's the way to do it. Yeah. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, I, I'm just watching the comments here. Uh, we haven't been into this one, but there's a ton of ideas that have just been flowing through the chat session in here. And luckily all this is captured. All this stuff's gonna go back into our sustainability committee, et cetera. And, and uh, it's all really good content. So please keep putting it back in. Um, unfortunately, we won't have time for Q and A, but Tom, I want you to wrap us up. Give us your perspective on what you believe uh, we should do to work together on the sustainability vision. No pressure there. Huh? <laughs> uh, so, you know, when I, when I started making a plan for CenturyLink for sustainability and kind of moving into this new role, I. I you know, doing research on kind of how how organizations progress through this thing, you know, and sustainability tends to start with compliance mm -hmm. within most organizations, right? So we start with the things we have to do to keep ourselves out of trouble, right? And then we move into kind of operational efficiency, right? And the, the idea of, okay, these are the things we can do where I can point to an economic benefit. I can go to the CFO and I can say, okay, right. you know, th there's value in this, right? I'm reducing energy costs. I'm doing whatever, right? But the third stage of evolution is innovation, right? It's when you can take the things that you're doing in your own world and make them a part of your value to the outside world, right? Yeah. Whether that's turning around and adding value to your customers by the way that you manage the data centers they're in. So they're, you know, their cooling is better, whatever that is. But I think when we look at our industry as a whole, we're now part of something that's, that's much bigger. And I was at a great mm -hmm. presentation a while back where a software developer talked about the greatest day in a developer's life is when you can remove 500 lines from code of something and nothing changes. Yeah. Right. And, and he was talking about efficiency. You're right. Mm -hmm. He was talking about that, that idea that, you know, and I think Daniela touched on this earlier everything has a negative environmental impact and a potential positive side to it, right? And so all the stuff that we're doing, we yeah. need to be having that kind of holistic view, right? And our role in that as the, you know, the builders of the digital age, right? To me is both the infrastructure piece of the equation and the kind of what the technology business as a whole does for society. Right. Absolutely. And I think that, that part of it is super important. And we, we need to remind ourselves we're in that positive impact and, and not believe the naysayers, be optimistic. And at the same time, be super aspirational. Right. And make sure that we're not um, sort of just taking it easy. We're not just doing compliance. We're not just doing efficiency, but that we're we're pushing radical innovation, as, as you like to put it. I, I think that if there's a takeaway theme from any of this, to me, it's that we're all in companies and, and in an industry that has proven time and time again that it can drive that radical innovation. And so 
given the crisis that we face, uh, I love the, the words of Greta Thunberg, you need to act like your house is on fire because it is, <laughs> right? That is we need, rad- we need radical innovation, right? And, yep. and so that's super important for us to come away from this with, with m- not having a lack of enthusiasm and not having a lack of energy, but doubling down on our energy level and our enthusiasm mm-hmm. to work amongst ourselves and, and in our day jobs and, and the things we do every day. Wonderful. You wrapped it up very well, Tom. So thank you uh, to you and all the panelists here. Um, Just amazing conversation. We could do this for three more hours, I'm sure. Um, So thank you again um, uh, for the panel.